<laughs> it was a gun. I'm not voting. If we want to build our nation. The problem with the Somalians. Just want to experience something else than a black man. Move on, move on. I feel like we're a horse with blinkers. Honestly, say, I was about to have sex and then I pulled Crap, but it's nice. <laughs> well, I'm Elise um, with an S, not with a Z. <laughs> and um, I am um, a very good friend of. Uh, of Hilton's um, sister, and um, I work within the health field at the Medical Research Council. My name is Sakthi, and um, actually I, I work in the government, but I sort of, I think, um, you know, my interest in being here and in listening to other people and where they're at today is um, because I'm born and bred in the ANC and I feel very strongly about the things that are, are happening to you know um, us at the moment um, and especially you know those of us who thought of ourselves as um, guardians of a particular set of values so I'm curious to know what people are thinking yeah for me there's something about feeling very blessed today um, feeling very inspired and for me, life is about not looking sometimes backward, but looking forward. And I think when I get into that space and I get into that energy, I feel very inspired. Because despite what is going on that's not wrong, I always think of what is possible and what we can appreciate. So tonight for me, it's just about appreciating all of you here and also just appreciating myself. Hi, my name is Famida. I'm from Durban, here for about four and a half years. I uh, know Hilton for about three years, great friends. I uh, currently work for Pam Golding Commercial Properties in the property market for about uh, over a year and a half. And I look forward to this interesting dinner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm Margaret Townsend. Must I look there? Um, can I look at all of them? Mm. Right there, yeah. Um, yeah, I was born in South Africa, but I left for 18 years to live in London. Came back four years ago and I'm really, really delighted to be here. My name is Terence Peterson. I'm delighted to have been invited to your dinner. And Hilton has been a family friend for many years, uh, come, coming back from the 70s. As well as I'm involved in adult education, so I've got a passion for training and facilitating learning, especially the most, the poorest of the poor. I was very saddened for the first time on Sunday night when I saw people dump their ANC cards. Mm. And I was thinking about what did we contribute to the ANC? You know, if I take my own story, I crossed the border um, on a Thursday night and the dangers associated with that. When I got to Botswana, I got arrested. And it was all in the name of the ANC because there was something about when you say the African National Congress of South Africa, I was born into a formation called the ANC and my, my family and everybody was involved and you know, my, every direction that my life took was, it was always that context. So, you know, there were certain principles that one grew up with, like, you know, justice <laughs> for a start, simple justice, you know, um, like integrity, you know, the sense that we were on the right side that's the thing. We were on the right side. We stood for the right principles and the right values and sacrificed. Huge, huge sacrifices. Many, many people made for these um, ideals, if you like. And so we're in government and now we have something that um, we never had before, which is the responsibility of power. And 14 years on or 15 years on, um, you know, we actually are in trouble. We're in trouble. And um, we have to really look at how we've done in power. Because we did really brilliantly to claim the power. But what have we done with it? That's the question going forward for me. And it is a question going forward. Because when I was saying to you that it's a critical, for me it seems like a really critical moment in time, you know, Every, every re re liberation movement reaches its sell-by date. I just didn't think, and I think a lot of people didn't think that this is it. For me, when I think of the ANC, I think of the leadership of Oliver Tambo. 
And when I think of it, something is very energizing about it because it was visionary leadership, inclusive leadership. But you know what? More than that, it was moral leadership. You know, I joined Umkonto Way during the height of 1985. And I was in the country and as an operative of the movement. And, you know, we used to throw stones, make barricades, eventually it became hand grenades and limpet mines and all of that. But for me, the essence was when I got to Lusaka, and I, when I got to Angola, the first thing we got was the politics of the ANC. And I remember I was part of a group of people that went um, to the camps and we would, would be escorted by a convoy. And when the guys who delivered us at the camps, when they went back, they were hit by an ambush. And I remember my first experience of real understanding of the ANC and this organization and getting an experience and a test of that was when Chris Hani came into the camps and he spoke about the history of resistance. And you know what, when I think of that, and it's like there's something, and that's why the painting that I did was an inspiration of the leaders that we know. And for me, the sad thing today is that we are missing with that tradition. If we look to the future, who is it? What is it that we need in a leader? I don't think that we need that kind of leadership, that we need to be looking there for our models because what I'm saying is that the challenge is different. The challenge is actually not to say our people don't have houses, come together, let's, let's um, stand up and, and fight this system. Our challenge is to say our people don't have houses. How are we going to get them houses? You know, how are we going to actually cut through the layers of corruption and bureaucracy and so on to actually get their, them houses, that we don't start churning out houses one, six months before elections? I think what is happening in our politics and in our organization right now, I think it comes at the right moment. And yes, we can call terror and them dissidents or whatever we want to call them, but I think there's even leadership in that, in that it costs, it will cost the leader to break away from something that you love. You see? And we will learn from that. So what do we need to do now to protect the organization, but also to start changing that organization? For me, it's really very, very clear that we have to reinvent ourselves. Um, and not in a superficial way, not in a superficial way at all, because there's a lot of there's a lot of value in what these people are saying. Never mind who they are, and that they were actually part and parcel of a regime that denied people access to treatment. These men of principle, you know, that Terrell Quarter sat chaired those NEC meetings. When did he stand up and say, Chief, Mr. President? What you're doing is wrong. But now all of a sudden he's a man of principle. You know, and I don't I don't go with, with that. So however, um, around the issue of the governance issues that they're raising, I think those are really good issues and those are things that, you know, we should we should interrogate. I can tell you that it's good that the ANC failed you and shocked you, because that means that you're a leader. You're gonna take the lead somewhere and you're going to either move into a direction where you feel comfortable, mm. and it's healthy, it's healthy. And that is how evolution takes place. Mm. I don't feel that there is substantial role modeling for our young children. If you look at young girls, the, the teenage pregnancy, right? It's a status symbol, and that has been documented to be pregnant. So what is the role modeling in that? And that, that's the issue of leadership. If you can define leadership for me and move away from a political party, because I want to first of all want to be a South African, and then I want to be a colored, and then I want to be a Cape Townian, and then I want to be uh, um, a member of a political party. And I think we're missing the point there. Because you're putting too much, I feel we are putting too much energy into the politics of politics. Where are we going to as leaders? How do you define a leader? And I would like to say that I'm a leader. 
because I'm, I'm an adult educator. I'm leading people to a point where they want to be. You are perhaps in the medical field, you are in the uh, agricultural field, and perhaps you're in the political field. You're all leading. So we must not lose the point of leadership, the true sense of leadership. I'm not a particularly political person, which is because of my background, because of all the political figures in it. Um, but I don't know if people are engaging with it. There's, yeah, there's, there, there's passion. There's passion at this table. It's like, you know, in London, you, you vote for Tony Blair or I can't even remember who the other one was, John Major. It's like, it's like who engages in that debate with passion? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot right here, not to mention the beautiful land, the sun, the sea, the mountains, but the people, mm -hmm. you know, the people are, mm -hmm. you know, South Africans, I think we are alive mm -hmm. in a way that in my 18 years, I missed. Mm -hmm. I really missed that. So, you know, I'm obviously speaking from a particular perspective because I went away for a long time, but there is not, there is not a millimeter in me that wants to leave this country. You know, it's mm -hmm. got an incredible amount going for it. But yes, it has struggles. But I think because you so in it, you you know, it's you know, not I'm always easy for you to appreciate. Well, as a young person, I mean, um, I've got no responsibilities at the moment. I have traveled quite extensively um, and I love traveling. But although I, I, I am positive about South Africa, um, I still like to sort of travel more and I'd, I'd like to experience working and living in another country. That's just me as mm -hmm. a person. But home is always home, you know, and I would come back. <laughs> when we create the right conditions, and you know, 1995, Rugby World Cup, South Africa, we were all dancing and singing. Um, 1994. No, not me. <laughs> that time, I wasn't yet a Springbok supporter that time. <laughs> you know, I was undercover at the time, but anyway, it was a moment that overwhelmed me. I think, you know what, even if you didn't dance and sing, okay, great. So, there was exceptions. So, not everyone, some of us. And for me, there was 1994. You know that moment when you looked at the people standing in those queues? Something inside of you moved. Um, I look at Bishop Desmond Tutu. You know, when that man speaks, something inside me Yeah, moves. but excuse me, I just have to register my note of extreme irritation with him. He's just bloody irresponsible of him to say, I will not vote. I understand that he wants to rattle the cages of the ANC, and I'm totally behind him in that. But actually, when he speaks publicly, he's not only speaking to them. And people are trying to convince me that it is only... The problem in the ANC is in the middle classes. But I'm sitting in Cooks, working class people are saying to me, they are not going to vote. They are, t so I test this on the young woman, a young woman, 20s, who is my domestic worker, and I ask her, which party do you support? She says, ANC. I said, and so how are you feeling about what's happening currently? She says, I am very angry. I'm very upset. So I tested the middle class, working class story. So that is the real feeling of people on the ground. And, they are very, and she's very angry. You know? Why? Or she's very upset. Why? I think. Is it the leadership? Is it something else? What is it? The anger that, that I've heard from both sides is the processes that have been followed the way things have been done. I think that's the issue. To be perfectly honest with you, in the last election, uh, I didn't want to vote Tabo Mbeki in again as president, <laughs> to be really honest with you. But sitting here in the Western Cape, I couldn't give my vote to the DA, so therefore, you know. Mm. Um, which is why I think this new formation, when they actually form themselves, will be really good for us because it will give people the option but more to the point it's going to be a wake-up call yeah and we need the wake-up yeah. call yeah because you know I, apart from KZN and there you must not say this but I'll say it here 
you know, the man who's destined to be our next president is not suitable. And that's the, one of the reasons why we're in this shit, because people don't actually recognize him as suitable. No, you're right. But that's it. You know, I love yeah. Jacob Zuma. I was mm. brought up with him, and I don't mean it in a facetious way. It's actually mm. now I see a matter of public record. It was in the Sunday Times. My mother paid the lobola for his first wife. That's, my mother has, and him have been friends since before I was born. Mm. That is what that means. I have, been, I have known him my entire life. I have adored him. You know, mm. sitting there, the woman who accused him of rape, her father and my mother and him were as thick as thieves. Mm. I know him. You know, it's heartbreaking for me to say that he's not suitable, mm. but he's not suitable. But why can't we forgive him? Forgive him what? Why can't we forgive him? It's not about forgiveness. Mm. I'm not angry with him. It's about suitability. It's about suitability. I'm yeah. talking about leadership, the thing For you the were highest. raising. Let's look at, at, at this particular uh, challenge. Um, if you want me to talk personally, I thought that maybe I shouldn't vote next year. That I should reflect and see what is happening and then with the next election I might vote but having said that I've worked too hard <laughs> not to go and vote but in my leadership position what how would I be influenced influences maybe not the right but how would I be influencing the people around me is to say that exercise your democratic right to vote. Even if you don't go and vote and put your cross somewhere, spoil the paper. Really, exactly. that's what I would say. Exactly. That is what I would say. But exercise your right to stand in that queue of voting. But if I was the president, and coming from the African National Conference as a president, I would really start listening to everybody, not just to the people that I want them to listen to me, but I would look at, good, this has happened. Are there things that we can change? I just mentioned a simple thing, like going to an AGM for almost five nights in a row because we couldn't find a quorum. Maybe there's something that needs to be updated about our everyday routine, policies and procedures in the, 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 the organization. You know, be open to change. I don't think, and, and this thing of um, the ANC and exile, we, that's what we want, don't want to hear. What is playing out here is the ANC in exile, the ANC that, that wasn't in exile. That's part of all this mess. You see, you sample both worlds. Because you were, for a short while, you were in exile. I was never in exile. But I supported the people that, that was my role, supporting the people that were here. So that's also what we need to sort out. So I, I don't think I have answers. You know, the, the leadership of the ANC, it's something I personally, and, and you might well have power to affect it, but I don't feel particularly empowered. So I think, Terence, you talked earlier about, you know, what was one of your dreams is to be a good parent. So I tend to be more micro in how I look at things. I look at how I affect my family and I look at how I can work in a South Africa that I can dream about. Which isn't, I find it very interesting, the conversation about macro politics. It's just, I, I go a little bit, I notice that I go a little bit hopeless around it because it's like Zuma, Ramaphosa, Sexuale, you know, I don't, no, I, I don't feel like I can go, hey, I'm in a campaign and then one of them is going to get in. I just go, Pfft. But your son might become the next yeah, but, but, leader. But, 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 <laughs> you know what? I, 
am doing my best to do as a parent because so I am I am um, using my power appropriately. It's just I go a little bit hopeless yeah, but Margaret, around some of the big stuff because yeah, but Margaret, I think there is an edge for you. Yeah. If I look at your role, you're an executive coach. You're someone with more than 18 years of global experience. You're a big time player. You work for one of the biggest consulting, leadership consulting, coaching consulting companies in the UK. I think you are diminishing your power. Aren't I the wrong color in this country to contribute to anything macro political? I feel the wrong color, I think. Uh, so what would inform that? Anybody, has anybody ever told you that sometimes we don't see color? Has anybody ever told you that? And Margaret, I think I want to challenge we you. Don't feel color. We don't see color. Yeah, okay. Like I, I would say to I'm some good. people around me, I would say, you know, okay, I talk about white people, but you're not part of that. You see, so sometimes you don't see color. I grew up in the internal organization. I was a member of the Cape Youth Congress. Yeah which was an affiliate of the United Democratic Front. You know, one of the proud traditions that we have that struggled inside this country and knowing mass mobilization was that we always fought for non-racialism. Mm. You know, the Freedom Charter says South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white, that no government can claim just authority unless it's based on the will of the people. Now, when we say that, we talk about you as well. Yeah. We talk about your sons, your husband, everybody you see, is included yeah. in that. And you know what I find very challenging in South Africa <coughs> is that white people cop out. And I'm honestly saying you are copping out. Mm. So I want to tease out. Mm. I want to amplify. I want to invite you in. Because you know, Margaret, the day you realize the difference you can make, mm. the lives that you can touch, yes. we see, need you on I our side. Maybe it's different the, now. the ANC, yeah. the, the, the um, democratic movement that we all know and that we all embrace was never about mm -hmm. exclusion. You know, when I was a student, so early 80s, you couldn't be an armchair activist, like in the UK, like in Europe. You can be an armchair activist. Here, you know, you were an activist, you went, you got into detention. I had friends who, you know, who, who went psychotic in detention. I mean, I, 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 I took the decision. I'm, I can't, you know, I, I'm, t I, I'm not gonna I, I'm not gonna put my life in danger. Now now it's different. And maybe I haven't updated my thinking. But I, I made the decision I can't fight I can't fight that fight to the death mm. because I'm not going to. I'm not I'm not gonna go to places where I get shot at. You know and, and I, I was at peace with that decision. It's just I hadn't I hadn't updated it. So Margaret, I hadn't realized that maybe now I can contribute and I can use my power in a way that doesn't threaten me. You know that um, it's just so that your skin is white and you are a white person and you come from that background. But what you are saying is 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 not just something that sits with white people and if i have to go back to the old uh, racial classification there are many indians there are many coloreds there are many kosa zulu sutu whatever speaking people who has never ever taken that leap into the progressive political movement of the time there are many people who, like you, were also scared by rallies, by toy toy, by all of that stuff. Not just white people. It's just now that everybody all of a sudden belonged to the progressive movement. Margaret, there's something about, I think when you find your own essence, and when you understand that the people sitting around this table want you to be part of something that is called a new South Africa. That the people around this table know that you've got a contribution to make. That the people around this table, mothers, fathers, also know that your children 
are worthy of whatever we're going to create in New South Africa. So that is the invitation. So come along as a mother, come along as a professional, come along as a woman, come along as a white person. <coughs> That's the invitation. That's an amazing invitation, and I think I haven't known that that was there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I haven't known Absolutely. that was there. Because I know all. there are many white people yeah. who have got difficulty with unraveling what they, what is their role. Mm. I've assumed, mm. I them. haven't realized it, but I've assumed that that invitation wasn't really mm. there, I'll be honest. Mm. I've assumed that, I don't know why, mm. but I've assumed that. I've a dream to have a, um, a good family, to nourish my family, so that I can be an example to my <coughs> granddaughter, that she can then extend that to her family to leave a, a legacy behind and I'm very passionate about education in South Africa and if all of us can educate each other not academically but just basically just basic education basically to assist people to read assist people to write and to assist people to have to have self-worth I've been through a lot I've experienced a lot um, not from my personal experience, not a normal 26-year-old that has experience. Um, I've been down the gutters. I mean, I've ne I never had anything to eat, but I never like went back to my parents to actually ask for help because I believe I'm a woman, and all women are survivors. And I pushed myself and I learned to be a survivor because my parents aren't going to be here uh, forever. So I'm, I'm a survivor. I'm a woman, and I want to be a a businesswoman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can I give you a oh, you, Jane. <laughs> I dream that one day I will be able to separate the personal and the political, irrespective of what power I have in either. And I dream about my boys being happy and fulfilling every little promise they can in themselves. It's to have the values that the African National Congress believed in. Because those, there's nothing wrong with those values, even today. But values need to be propped up by policies and procedures. I wish for every South African to be given the chance to make the shift that I think you helped me make tonight which is to take personal responsibility for what is happening in the wider political landscape. That's the first part of my dream. And the second part of my dream is that we do appreciate what we already have mm -hmm. and not whinge and moan about it because the glass is half full. You know, there's so much money that we have. But the first part, so I thank you all for that. But if every single person out there who was feeling like, ah, oh, can't do much about this, can make that shift, I think then, then there's a, there is a, you know, there's a mass mobilization for want of a different word. You know, I had the privilege to um, be involved in Mazimbo, the ANC school, Solomon Slango Freedom College, Somafco. And on the walls there, that is the slogan, and I'm going to read that to you because I don't know why, but throughout all of this, that's something that always moves me. And when you talk of a dream, I don't know why, but I gravitate back to that. And it reads, um, tell my people that I love them and that they must continue with the struggle. My blood will nourish the tree that will be the fruits of freedom. And I'm going to say it again because when I say that, it does something to my body, it does something to my energy. And it's, it's like a clarion call for me. Um, tell my people that I love them and that they must continue with the struggle. My blood will nourish the tree that will bear the fruits of freedom. And for me, when I look at that, so if you talk about my vision and I embrace that as my own, because it talks to two things, it talks about the people. If whatever I do and I'm a part of is not based on the people, the will of the people, I would fail. Um, the essence of why I joined the struggle, why I joined Umkonto mm -hmm. and being a people soldier. That's the one aspect. 
and then the other part is my blood will nourish the tree so there's also something about personal responsibility and i also have a vision that i can create the change that i desire i have power i have influence and i can make the difference so for me it's like i hold those two energies equally there's the people there's me and when we find that balance something magical can happen